Um, it's actually, Father had me scheduled for two talks, one on apophatic theology and the other one on the, um, the heroine of Hades. And I was going to speak on the um, apophatic theology. I went to try to find my notes and realized <coughs> I didn't have anything typed up. <laughs> and um, I finally found my handwritten notes. And whether I understood them when I wrote them or not, I'm not sure. But um, I need to go back and work on them a little bit before I try taking that on. A lot of what I'm talking about comes from a book, Christ the Conqueror of Hell, by Metropolitan Hilarion. Um, we're dealing with what happens from Good Friday till Sunday on the Resurrection. And to be honest, this is something that there, the provenance of this is not really strong. There are a few references in Scripture, but most of what we have is coming from third-party sources. What, what uh, sometimes called sort of the apocryphal literature. Even if the foundations are not solid in Scripture, and this is not dogma, this is something that's very strong in orthodoxy. You find this, um, there are different spots in some of the services where this is talked about and referenced. And if you look at the icon that we call the resurrection icon, it is not really an icon of the resurrection. It is an icon of Christ delivering people from Hades. So this belief, this doctrine, is quite strongly held to. And it almost goes unquestioned in the church. We even find this in the Apostles' Creed. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead and ascended to heaven. Scripture talks about rising from the dead, but descending into hell we don't find in Scripture. We get hints of this in like 1 Peter 3. For Christ also has suffered for sin, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison, which sometimes were disobedient, when once the long-suffering God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved by war. A rather vague reference. Went and preached to the spirits in prison. What does that mean? It's not clear. Or Matthew 7, 52, talking about just after the resurrection. And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose. There's a resurrection going on almost before Christ's resurrection at this time. Matthew 27, 53, and came out of the grave after, no, I'm sorry, it was after the resurrection, after his resurrection, and went into the holy city and appeared unto men. You get this deliverance from death <coughs> going on. And Matthew 12, 40, referring to Jonah as a sort of archetype of this. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Heart of the earth is not quite the same as a reference to Hades, but there's some imagery here. And we have these other references, like Acts 2.27, Because I will not leave my soul in hell, neither will I suffer thy holy one to see corruption. Or later on, thou hast made known to me the way of life, and thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. Men and brethren, let me speak freely unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and the sepulchre is with us until, until this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn an oath with, to him, that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He seen this before spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. This Jesus has God raised up, wherein we are all witnesses. In Ephesians, we get this allusion 
Wherefore he says, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive, he gave <coughs> gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that did um, destined in the same about he that destined is the same also that ascended up far above all heaven, that he might fill all things. Again, there's no clear sort of explicit teaching there. These are illusions. These are telegrams. And part of this is it's it is sort of confusing. How do you figure this out? What is the geography here? He ascended into the heart of the earth. He ascended down, you know, descended, ascending. We're talking geography, but is this really geography? Because we have to remember that Christ, his body remains in the tomb. This is his spirit that is going someplace else. So it's a spiritual realm more than what it might be a physical realm. So this is where we have to be careful with the language of what we're dealing with. It's also that we have confusion of language between hell, Hades, Gehenna, and several other different terms. Hell proper is what we find in Revelation, after the final judgment. <coughs> what is talked about here is more of Hades or Gehenna, the place of the dead. What that is, where that is, again, there's some ambiguity. And exactly what that realm is like is ambiguous. Of This is not sort of the cartoon images of hell, the place of Satan who's ruling over, over things, tormenting people. Um, we have allusions of this, of Jesus, when he talks about um, the rich man and Lazarus. And there's a gulf of separation. Um, it's sort of this waiting state, a natural waiting state, because it's a state before the resurrection, so it's a separation from God, which is also abnormal. It's the separation of the body from the spirit, which is abnormal. But it is this idea that there is still an existence of people. We don't disappear. We exist even in death. Um, yeah, the sources are like the apocryphal literature, um, Proto-Evangelium, if you've heard of that, um, the Gospel of Nicodemus, or the Ascension of Isaiah, some um, writings that the church has passed along, but they're not some of the main writings that we normally refer to. In the liturgy, we have Christ is risen from the dead, trampling down death by death, and if all those <coughs> in the tomb be still alive. Now we have another term, in the tomb, bestowing life. There's an ode of Solomon used by St. Melodios of Sardinia and Ephraim of Syria and Romanos of Melodius. Sheol saw me and was shattered, and death ejected me and many with me. I have been vinegar and bitterness to it, and I went down with it as far as its depth, and I made a congregation of living among the dead. And I spoke with them, by living lips, in order that the word may not be unprofitable, and those who had died ran towards me. And they cried out and said, Son of man, have pity on us, and deal with us according to your kindness, and bring us up from the bonds of darkness, and open for us the door by which we may come out to you. For we perceive that our death does not touch you. May we also be saved with you, because you are our Savior. Then I heard their voice and placed their faith in my heart, and I placed my name upon their head, because they are free and they are mine. Um, we find reference to this in Ignatius of Antioch, where he talks about, it was for this reason too that the Lord descended into the regions beneath the earth, preaching his advent there also, and declaring the remission of sins received by those who believed in him. Now all those believed in him who had hoped towards him, that is those who proclaimed his advent and submitted to his dispensation, the righteous men, the prophets, the patriarchs, to whom he remitted sin in the same way as he did to us. So, 
this is a place where the dead exist from the time of creation up until the death of Christ. It is no more. Um, if you listen during Holy Week to some of the hymns, there's all sorts of this beautiful poetic imagery. <coughs> of, um, it talks about death becomes personified. Um, death is referred to as sort of like the sea monster or a big fish. And Christ on the cross is a fishing hook. It's lowered down to deceive the fish who grasps it in its mouth, thinking there's just another body, that it, another dead person that it's going to consume. And it talks in this graphic language of how the fish becomes ill and vomits up all the dead that it's held captive up until that time. I think the church is realistic here, and that this is something we don't have. It's hard to explain. We don't have hard teachings on it. So the language of poetry, the language of imagery, becomes the best way to try to describe what is going on here. Because the key element is Christ in his death. Because he is human, he enters into death as everyone else does. But because he's divine, death cannot hold Christ. And therefore, death itself becomes destroyed by death. It's a poetic language to explain the sort of metaphysical, something that's impossible to really grasp and understand in technical language. But something that's key to our belief that Christ is our salvation. Um, it's all these implications. This is something that was never questioned by the early church. The <coughs> early church just assumed that this was true and never debated it, never argued it. Um, you know, and this is, I think, where the East has sort of taken this and maximized the usage of it, the belief of it. That Christ has destroyed hell, death, has offered salvation to all. It is not just that he released some from Hades, but all are free. The resurrection is in a sense of the salvation of all people, as far as that goes. That all people are freed from death. There is no ceasing to exist or left in some strange state. This is eternal life given to all. But it's always this issue of how to respond to that free will. You know, there's this question, too, of are people able to change after death? Because we catch bits of this that um, John the Baptist, when he dies, he goes in to Hades and preaches to all. But the question is whether... Do they hear him? Can they make a change at that point? What's going on? Again, scripture is vague and not giving much answers here. Now, critical of this is this issue of free will. Is the soul on its own able to change? Or how much is after death does the soul become unchangeable like the angels in Again, question, great questions, great speculations, but there just aren't many answers to it. Um, again, this is the Eastern issue of the love of God and how immense it is. That even in death, Christ is reaching out to give his love to all. Um, that hell, Hades, is not a place of punishment, though it may not be a place of comfort. Sort of like the lost sheep, that Christ is willing to go into the depths to find everyone. This is the love of God, and I think that is the strength of what this is teaching us, is the immensity of God's love to overcome death to bring us to himself. Questions? Anybody else read up on this or have any? You read all sorts of things? Yeah, I mean, uh, 
it's been a while, but I read the gospel uh, album. Ah. And uh, it's very good. I think the first, like, seven chapters, maybe, is uh, it's a conversation, but I don't remember. I think Pilate might be involved. His uh, other name of it is the Acts of Pilate. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And this is the nature of orthodoxy, that we get a lot of literature like this, um, where even sort of worst case scenario, that this is somebody writing things down, writing stories, putting words into people's mouths, it reflects the thinking of the time. And that thinking, even though possibly a little muddled in places, still has content of the beliefs of the church. Yeah, Rob. So there is an interpretation of the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, where Lazarus mm -hmm. goes down to the bosom of Abraham, and the rich man goes into what's called the flame. Mm -hmm. Is this is this Hades is in this parable? So is it like an idea that from Judaism and sort of carried over into Christianity? A lot of these are. Um, Jesus is not going to... He's telling stories to make a point. You're not going to fabricate something nobody's ever thought of and then it's going to lead you off into these long debates of... Uh, why did you use this illustration? That's nothing to do with what we believe. He's going to pick what's common to their understanding and then put twists into it that are, um, that are the real point of the story. So, yeah, um, you know, this is the debate between the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Is there a resurrection or not? So they're talking, debating about what is the state of death? Where are people after they die? If you're going to be resurrected, you can't just disappear. You've got to be around. So they're trying to figure out where, what, how this works. Yeah. And in one of the hymns, I guess on uh, some Saturday after six or Sunday morning, they say that uh, uh, the hymn is saying the Lord Jesus appeared to his mother. Like, it, it sounds like he wouldn't leave her grieving. He went to her, and then from there, he continued on towards the resurrection. There may have to be more with Saturday after 6 p.m. You know, I guess he, he went, went to the people in Hades, he went to his mother. I'm not that familiar with that tradition, what the sequences there is of... Um, I was thinking that that would have come from church tradition. Yeah. There's a lot of traditions I'm not familiar with. Oral, <laughs> oral word of yeah. mouth tradition. Okay. I don't know on that one. I do like Matthew 27 when the graves opened and mm -hmm. after his resurrection the dead rose from their graves and walked in the city. I think there must have been atomic power just crackling in the air <laughs> that brought these people back to life for a period of time. You get these strange things in scripture occasionally. Of, um, I believe it. Clearly, well, it's not a mere belief in them. It's it's more the problem of trying to explain them. Of um, 
This is after the resurrection. Christ has brought people, their souls, out of, out of the state of death. And there are these that go into the city. Well, do they have resurrected bodies or what? Um, where do they go after that? There's a lot that's, yeah. So that's my question is, so Christ came down to me, and you brought him up, and then we have a resurrected body. Not, so they, were they down in Hades and then they're resurrected? When they're walking around and there's somebody in court, what happens? I mean, I would think so. I think, I think they were resuscitated like he brought Lazarus back to life, but at some later time over on Crete or wherever mm -hmm. Lazarus passed away again. Yeah. Okay. We, can, we can debate these things, but it's one of those things we just have to leave it. it it's part of the mystery. I guess my, my question would be one of those, somebody had to record what right. happened. Right. Can we have that next? So, and who knows what conversations Christ had with people. Right. Or what these people who are, came out of the graves and are walking around in Jerusalem, what they're telling people. So is tradition that Christ took the sign of the cross down in Hades? Or is that, am I thinking? Did you get that out of Nicodemus or uh, uh, details? I mean, there's a lot, like, actually, I would recommend reading it. It goes into Now I'm going to have to. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very detailed. It's okay. very good. Okay. Yeah. Um, and a lot of these traditions sort of get embellished as they get told. <laughs> right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Now, one of the reasons I think it's true that they were seen walking around in the city mm -hmm. after they left the graves, they would have had a cure for some kind, like Lazarus did. Or some Somehow you could see that. Mm -hmm. But you, you don't ordinarily get information like that from people who, who are any range of intelligence and perception who say, you know, we saw them or we saw him. He'd been dead for years. You, you don't get that from people reporting mm -hmm. the dead walking around and seen by people. Yeah, we just had this reference in, in Acts there about this going on. Because you know, <coughs> the general doctrine is that death has been destroyed. This is why you now find, like in Revelation and everything else, talking about the souls in heaven. This is now the new abode of the souls. Mm -hmm. If you look at the icon, the resurrection icon, which is the heroine of Hades, um, it's beautiful because what you see is there's these two doors that are in the shape of a cross. And then you see these broken keys scattered all, the, all around. This imagery that the chains, the keys holding things are now... They've been blown away, destroyed. As somebody, some people put it, if, if there's anybody still in hell, it's locked from the inside, not from the outside. But yeah, that, that is the imagery that we see, that um, the locks, the symbols of that captivity. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Pulling out people on both sides. Adam and, and on Eve. One side, they have a nimbus, and on the other side, that they don't have a nimbus. So is the implication that all the dead, righteous and wicked, and the best are not, have ascended with Christ out of Hades? Yes. Okay. This is why, in a sense, it's legitimate in a narrow way to say that Orthodoxy believes in universal salvation in that Christ has saved everyone from death. 
but that's a long way from justification and sanctification. Again, we've got different things, different places. Yes, um, for God so loved the world. He loved everyone. He wants all people to be saved. But yet clearly there's the sheep and the goats issue. Well, then there's the following up on the John 3, 21, where Jesus says, this is the verdict, light has come into the world, but men so love the darkness, they refuse to come into the light because they deeds are evil. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you think about the verdict is given at the end after all the testimony is given. And so that, that is legal language, what Jesus is saying. This is the verdict. And it's kind of like, as that the scholars they, they cho 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 chose darkness. Mm -hmm. They saw the light. Mm -hmm. And they ran away from it. So what happens now? <laughs> <laughs> Another time. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Like it says in there, though, I think in John, uh, that those who have done good will, will rise to eternal life, and then those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. <coughs> There's a biblical passage on that. So, yeah, like you said, everybody has been saved from death. But how we live out our resurrected life in eternity, the state will be different mm -hmm. depending on how mm -hmm. we, who we were, mm -hmm. to what extent we. Mm -hmm. It's the problem that God has done everything he can. Yeah. It's now up to us. Thank you. Thank you, Alan.